Mm-hmm. So, I'm not sure if I told you about this, dude. This is the, uh, I'm going to show you how this works. So this is that commander timer that I was talking about. So I'm sure if you can see it, but I, if I go to the menu, this mm-hmm. is what I like about it. So I can go to the different presets so I can arrow up or down the presets. Mm-hmm. Like for preset number two, I have a part time. So if I want to do my five second drills for the fundamentals program, I just select the preset. It already has the delay or instant. It has the part time set and hit go. And of course, not to be too loud on the microphone, it will give me my five second part time. Um, so, nice. and then there's a second beep. So that's the cool thing about that timer. It's not the exclusive one I use, but uh, these are robust. So are we live, man? Or are we, do we have we some are live. Or? Six, we have- seven people are on so far, Mike. Wow. Seven people jumping on the Facebook live. I guess we are live on the IDPA page, shooting performance and the American Warrior Society. Now we'll give a, we'll give folks just a couple more minutes to jump on and, um, We'll get into this. I think you're going to maybe even read my bio this morning, which we don't, we don't normally do, but I'm going live on the IDPA page, or we are going live on the IDPA page. And I know some of you maybe don't know who I am, which is perfectly fine. And then when this replays in the morning, so hey, that Rob Pincus is on. Wow. Holy moly, dude. Hi, Rob. Good morning, Rob. That's awesome. We don't see Mr. Rob Pincus on very much. So. No, we don't. Um, hey, folks, if you're jumping on, uh, look before Rich reads my bio, good morning. We're doing a Facebook Live. And today I'm talking about competition handgun gear and setup. Of course, uh, I have all of my gear here. I have a bunch of different handguns. What I want to do is I want to give you some some tips and some things you can follow to perfect, you know, your, your we'll start from the bottom, your belts to your mag pouches, to your holsters, to the guns themselves. And then, then I would suspect we'll do a bunch of Q&A. Of course, today I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Rich Brown, my partner in crime, who has been jumping on these live streams with me on Wednesday to feed me questions. So he's in the background. If you're if you're watching this and you have a question, uh, of course, you can throw that question up at any point in time. One thing that I want to get into before we get going is safety, safety, safety. So if you have a firearm in the room with you, if you're going to handle your firearms, if you're going to look at your competition again while you do this, all dry fire safety rules apply. Please make sure you have no loaded firearms, no ammunition in the room. Get rid of your loaded firearms or ammunition right now. If you're carrying a loaded firearm, that's perfectly fine. Please, just no gun handling. Also, uh, make sure you have a safe backstop if you're gonna dry fire or handle your gun, and all other safety rules apply, like your trigger finger position, your muzzle direction, and everything else. So please, if you don't wish to comply with the safety rules, I would tell you to go watch something else, but I know you're not gonna do that because you're going to comply with the safety rules. So please just be safe at all times. That's a key thing. Mr. Rich, I know you wanted to read my bio. Please, would you talk about my bio real brief, briefly for those that may not know me? Well, I'm sure most people know you here this morning, but uh, for those that don't or may get this shared to them later, Micah is a former Marine and law enforcement officer and owner of Shooting Performance LLC, which is a full service training company and the American Warrior Society and the American Competitive Shooting Society. Micah is also co-host of the former Best Defense, which was the Outdoor Channel's leading firearms instructional show. Not sure why they took that off. Anyway, previously, Mike was the Chief Operations Officer, Director of Training, and Senior Instructor at the United States Shooting Academy. Prior to that, as a when Mike worked in the federal government, he served as Branch Chief and Lead Instructor for the Firearms Division of the Federal Air Marshal Service, as well as a Senior Instructor at FLETC, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Shooting accomplishments are vastly too much to talk about this morning, but suffice it to say, Mike is a Grand Master in USPSA and a Distinguished Master in IDPA. They don't give those out. Having competed in the shooting sports nationally, Mike adds to this experience with more than 15 years of experience in various martial arts, including multiple ranks and a black belt in Okinawan freestyle. And Mike is making his way up the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu ladder. I need to catch up to him, but Mike, there is your bio, my brother. Good morning, folks. Hey, so let's jump into it. I have a couple things I would like you to do right now, though. Get a notepad or open up the notes on your phone if you can. Probably a notepad so you could, if you're watching this on your phone, you can take notes. So because because I want to give you some tips you can actually walk away and and apply to your competition handgun gear setup. Now, by the way, if you're jumping on and you're like, hey, Mike, I'm more of a defensive shooter. That's my thing. Understand we did an entire defensive handgun cycle last month. All of those live videos are on the Facebook page. You can go back and rewatch those. And we're also posting those on the YouTube pages. A lot of those links are in the show notes. So go ahead and grab some notes. You can pen in a a notepad if you need to. 
uh, as well as get ready to rock and roll, get your gear, whatever else. The second thing I want you to do is I want you to share this real quick. I have a feeling with three pages, we're going to finally hit our goal of 100 live viewers at one time. I know we do this. If all of you click the share button, all of you IDPA members, all of you on American Warrior Society, all of you on Shooting Performance, take a second to share it in my groups and a couple of the groups out there. Let's see how many people we can get on this morning. Uh, we're going to get into it. By the way, as we're doing this, uh, if you're a coin member, one of my members and Rich and I's members, shout out to you. Post your coin number up there, up there if you want to find out more about that. We may throw some links up later on. And of course, if you're an American Competitive Shooter Society member, throw that up there as well. Welcome. Uh, all of the programs we're talking about are in there. And we do have a couple show sponsors today, too. I'm going to show you the Precision Holsters Fast Holster, which is one of our sponsors. I'm also going to show you the Cool Fire Trainer here in a second, which is one of our show sponsors. So, do me a favor, while I'm taking a sip of coffee, go ahead and click that share button. Hmm. Time to get my brain awake, right, so I can talk about some cool gear. Um, one last thing, as we're doing this, if you have a question, please uh, post it in the comments. As I'm talking about gear, I know you're going to have some questions probably about gear. Uh, this is more of a gear discussion versus a technique discussion. We're going to start the technique discussion next week. So I look forward to seeing you on those live streams where you can actually participate and do the drills or the draw or the reloads or whatever we're working on this month along with me. So make sure you're prepared to do that. Set your calendar next Wednesday, 7.30 a.m. Uh, we're probably going to go over some of the fundamentals, how to speed up your draw process, how to speed up your reload process, and there are three or four keys to speed on both of those manipulations that we can learn and we can practice in dry fire, okay? So I know you're, you've already shared, so let's get right into it. Um, I have a bunch of gear here, um, and matter of fact, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to talk about this, the basis of the system, right? When, I, when I'm talking about the basis of your competition system, that's your belt, um, I have several different belts. I'm actually wearing a belt that I carry on a daily basis made by Precision Holsters. By the way, Precision Holsters, one of my sponsors, one of our sponsors, full disclosure. So if we talk about them, of course, they're a show sponsor. But I do have some other brands here as well. This is a Safariland belt. Um, this is actually a, an old school stiff belt that I got a long time ago. And I don't even know who made this belt. I'm not sure what the manufacturer is. But the reason I wanted to show you these in terms of a competition belt, and for those of you that uh, our USPSA shooters, I am going to show you some USPSA style rigs as well on you know, the dark side for you IDPA shooters. Uh, hopefully both of you or all, most of you compete in both sports. Um, but these two belts are the primary ones I will use in IDPA other than my precision holsters belt. And the reason I've selected a belt like this is because of the stiffness or the rigidity of the belt. So here's tip number one for you. Your belt, in an IDPA, of course, we have to run our belt through our belt loops. You can't have the external Velcro type system. Your belt is the foundation of your, of your holster and the foundation of your mag pouches. So if your belt is flimsy or loose, maybe you have one of those cheap leather belts from Walmart, every time you put your holster on or your mag pouches on, it's going to move along or move around. It, it may move along the belt, literally move around. And by the way, that is... Um, that's applicable in a defensive carry setup as well. If your carry holster or your mag pouch is moving around and changing angles on the belt, that's a big issue because every time you reach for the handgun, you're going to be getting an inconsistent grip. So number one, start off with a very, very rigid belt, as rigid as you could possibly find. Um, if you go to Precision Holsters, by the way, ask them for the IDPA level rigidity belt. They have a carry belt that's a little less rigid, and they have one they make um, for more for uh, IDPA. So this is the my belt system. This one does have, of course, a Velcro system where I can use uh, Velcro in and out. It actually fastens with Velcro, but it's of a size where I can actually put it inside uh, my belt loops. Okay. Now, this thing I want to talk about is uh, your holster setup and your mag pouch setup. Now, I have uh, I have both my IDPA rigs. Right. Um, this is one of my. This is a matter of fact. This is my signature line holster with precision holsters. This is this is called the FAST holster, P-H-A-S-T. Of course, P-H stands for precision holsters, A-S-T, FAST. Get it? It's kind of like a play on words. Anyways, by the way, we have 79 live viewers. That's super cool. I think we're totally going to hit 100 today, Rich. Um, but anyways, the, the, the key I want to show you on the holster and the belt relationship is very, very simple, right? If I have the right belt set up, that's stiff enough, and I have the right holster set up. Now, these particular um, holders are set up with a, a length 
where when I put my belt on the holster, or excuse me, the holster on the belt itself and snap it down, it's very, very rigid. Matter of fact, if you're putting your belt or holster and belt together, um, if it's not rigid enough, you're going to find that you can grab the holster and you can move it around. So there's tip number one for you. I want you to look at your belt, whatever you use for your competition sport and your holster. If you have it off right now, go ahead and put the holster on the belt. And then once you've done that, try to move it. So if you look at my belt and holster setup, it's physically very difficult for me to move the holster. Um, okay, so that's that's tip number one. If, if it's not, if it moves around, or more importantly, I want you to watch the holster. If I try to, to camp the holster while it's on the belt itself, I barely move this sucker. There's not a lot of movement. So if you can move your holster a lot, then the angle is going to be changing. And I should have said this originally, by the way, before we open up for some Q&As. If, you um, if you're setting up your gear for IDPA or USPSA, you have to read the rule book because there are a bunch of rules that might be a little bit different in IDPA versus USPSA. Some of the things I'll be talking about today won't be legal or applicable in IDPA. Um, depending on what division of USPSA you shoot, uh, they may or may not be legal. And by the way, if you're jump, jumping on, I see a bunch of people on. Man, we have 80 people on live. That's fantastic. Uh, if you could throw it on there. If you haven't shared this live stream, do me a big favor and click that share. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. That's, that's tip number one. You have to have a rigid belt system and a holster that doesn't move around, okay? Now, I'm going to show you tip number two, and once again, make sure this is legal within the division and the sport you compete. Tip number two is to play with your angles and position of the holster in relation to the belt. Now, in terms of IDPA, the, the holster has to carry the handgun in a vertical position or a position where the muzzle is canted to the rear. You can't rotate the holster where the tip of the gun is pointed for, right? It has to be vertical or to the rear unless they've changed that in the new holster rules. Okay, so when you're setting this up though, but what I can do within the rules is I can tweak the angle that the holster is mounted to the actual carrier. So if you look at the, how this carrier is mounted, I have a smaller washer that's squished down in the back and I have a slightly bigger washer um, on the front. So what that does is this actually changes. Let me go ahead and grab something real quick for you. Um, I'm going to grab one of my ESP guns. This is one of my beautiful Wilson Combat CQBs. Look at that finish on that sucker. You like that gun? And yes, full disclosure, I am sponsored by Wilson Combat as well. So if you're looking at the gun going, how does he get a Wilson Combat? Well, they actually give them to me. It only took me 22 years of training and several hundred thousand dollars in ammo to get there. But anyways, there's one of my beautiful guns unloaded. So if I take this gun and stick it in the holster. What I, My point here in terms of adjusting how it's mounted is, um, if this were a thinner washer, the gun would point more like this. Because it's a thicker washer, the gun points more like this. So when the gun is in the holster on my side in the legal position, the muzzle points more toward the target than it would if it were like this. Now this is gonna be completely dependent on your, your size, your build, your hands, your arms, all that stuff. But what you want to do is you want to adjust that holster position on your belt so when you grab it, there's not a lot of breaking of your wrist or movement of your hand to actually mount it, right? So what I do is I'm trying to tweak and get the handgun in the most efficient position possible, okay? Now I'm going to show you something uh, kind of unique, and then we'll do some more Q's and A's. So if I grab, um, so this is my IDPA rig set type setup. If I grab my USPSA setup, which has an internal Velcro belt, right? And an out external Velcro belt. So I put the internal Velcro belt that my hand's on right now inside my belt loops and then I Velcro the whole thing to the belt, right? But if you look at the holster position and height, the holster position and height of both of those holsters is the same. Okay, so that's, that's uh, tip number two for you. Tip number one was find a rigid belt and make sure you mount your holster to it so it doesn't move. Tip number two is, keep your gear as consistent as possible, right? Make sure that your belt system and your gear, uh, whether you compete in IDPA or USPSA, and if you can translate this to, to your defensive carry gear, is as consistent as possible. So when you're reaching for the handgun, you're reaching for the same place uh, and same position of the handgun. That's gonna improve your draw process, okay? By the way, I know I've been talk, 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 talk. Do we have, Rich, do we have any questions we need to feed me? And by the way, we have a bunch of 
people on. We almost are at 90. I am super excited, man. Yeah, we Good hit morning, folks. 92, 93. Come on. Click the share. 94. Come on. Hit 100. We're so close. Sorry. I know this is getting off track a little bit, but I'm getting excited. Mr. Rich, questions or comments I need to address that you've seen so far? No questions yet. Strangely enough, everyone's Ooh. eerily silent this morning. That's okay. Um, and by the way, uh, we're going to get into some more depth. Now, the second thing I want to show you is my mag pouch setup. So I'm going to give you another little secret. Here. I, have, I have more gear than you could possibly imagine. So this is my mag pouch setup. The, the way I'm going to set up, this is an IDPA style mag pouch setup. The way I'm going to set up in terms of the distance and how it's mounted is I'm going to make sure it's uh, as far away from my body as possible within the legal distance. I think that in IDPA, it's a, I don't know, it's a one inch dowel, two inch dowel. Someone posted up there that knows the rules really well. But the bottom line is they have to be able to put a dowel between the holster of my body, the mag pouch of my body, and it that touches the, the magazine of my body and the gun of my body. So I, I have to be careful of distance. And USPSA, you can put it pretty much anywhere you want these days. But I'll show you the little secret that I want to show you in terms of your mag pouches. If you're wondering how to keep your mag pouches on your belt from moving around, from canting or sliding a bunch, here's my little tip for you. If you can see what I've done inside the mag pouch surfaces is I've got some skateboard tape on both sides of the mag pouch clip, right? So when I actually take the mag pouch and I clip it onto the belt itself, okay, it takes a little bit of pressure to clip it. It's kind of thick in there, right? But once I actually get it clipped down, now the mag pouch will not move around because of that skateboard tape. Right. So if you're thinking about trying, maybe and some of you may carry with a leather belt, you may use a leather belt 90 PA. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, as, assuming it has the rigidity that you need. OK, uh, but the bottom line is that skateboard tape really prevents your mag pouches from moving around uh, on your system. So give that a shot. So when you're when you're setting up your mag pouches, maybe put some skateboard tape inside there. If you have a clip like this. Now, I know some of you have a belt loop type attachment. Well, in theory, then you could probably, if you had to, if, if this were a full bell loop attachment, you could put a little skateboard tape on the inside side of the mag pouch itself, too. And that'll keep it from sliding around and moving. So there's a little tip for you in terms of your mag pouches. Now, um, let's switch over to the dark side rig once again. Mike, we got a couple of questions. Okay, throw, throw them up there. What are my questions? Okay, this one is, why the dots attachment versus belt loops? Yeah, good question. So the dots attachments versus belt loop allows me to very, very quickly switch out the mag pouches and the gear. Uh, belt loops are fine, but when, when I'm personally, like when I'm really, let me grab this sucker here. Uh, I need a bigger table, folks. So if I'm sliding this particular belt because it's so rigid and so thick through most of the slots on a on uh, those attachments, uh, it's it's harder for me to get the belt on and the holster mag pouches on exactly where I want them. So the dots hangers allow me to position the holster and the mag pouches differently if I want to very, very quickly, and I can get it on and off very quickly. So I found them to be very, very robust systems. Um, they also give me some flexibility in terms of you know where I mount them. Now in this case, this is as high as it can be on the dots hanger, because if it were any lower, uh, if the holster were any lower, then the bottom edge of the front strap of the handgun would be too low. So that the holster has to sit at a certain height within IDPA. But yeah, it's, it's simply personal preference. And I just like the way the dots hangers allow me to clip the mag pouches or holsters on the, on the belt itself. Okay. And we've got another question, Mike. Okay. What type of belt was that is what Dion wants to know. Um, as I said earlier, uh, this particular belt is an off brown. I don't know what it is. Um, I have this holster. I, I don't have my precision holster belt in the room. I forgot it outside. Sorry. This is another version I used to use. This one is made by Safarland. I think it's an 032 or something like that. Um, and I, actually, I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you my carry belt as well because precision holsters does make a belt. Um, with kind of a unique clip. So this is the the belt they make basically. The tip of the hole or the tip of the belt goes in here. They've got a clip, and then the Velcro adjustment is how you adjust the size. This is my everyday carry belt. They also have another one that has more rigidity and thickness. That's pretty specifically for IDPA. It's almost too rigid and thick to sit like against the seat of a car for long periods of time, um, which is why I carry this one. But I have another one that I left outside that I would show you, made by Precision Holster. Okay, but whatever you select, you want to select a belt that will fit inside your 
you know, your belt loops uh, and, and is very rigid. Just, you just pick the most rigid belt you possibly can. Um, this belt uh, is a, another variety of belt. This is actually, sorry about that microphone here, folks. No, another belt that Precision Holsters actually mounted my holsters to and mag pouches. This is extremely thick and rigid. It's almost too thick and rigid for me to use with my IDPA setup, okay? Um, by the way, also, uh, one last thing in terms of this, if you look at my mags on my, my darker side, my USPSA side, Rick, these are very specific in terms of the angle and position, right? Um, my holster is in the exact same spot in my belt, but my angle and my position of these mag pouches is, uh, if you look at them, one is slightly higher. This is their full USPSA setup that is made by Precision Holsters. The mounting solution is not perfect yet. They're still working on that because it takes a lot of work to get these positioned, but it's probably the fastest rig I've ever owned in terms of loading all the way down to, you know, your last pouch, which is super important when you're shooting single stack or production or whatever else. Hey, there's full straighter on. That's awesome, man. Maybe full straighter will be nice today. I well, he's it. answering questions for you, Mike. Is he? Oh, that's so nice. Phil Strader is such a nice yeah. guy. Dion says, does IDP allow uh, optics now? Like what's on the XDM Elite? And Phil says they do. It's called carry optics. Yeah, of course. They, they sure do. IDPA has, has had a carry optics division for uh, years now. Okay. So let's talk. Um, we've talked about your belt. We've talked about holster position and mag pouch setup. I gave you some tricks on some of that stuff. Let me, let me talk to you about some other gear. Oh, and by the way, this is one of our show sponsors. Uh, this is a kit called the Cool Fire Trainer. Um, you can go to coolfiretrainer.com forward slash cleaner to check it out. But basically, what this kit includes in a simplest term, if, if you get the basic kit, is a barrel and a recoil spring. So if you are getting ready for the season and you're dry firing like you should be a lot, but you want a truly advanced level of dry fire, check out a Cool Fire. Because a Cool Fire will allow you to do this. So... I'm going to demonstrate this really quickly. This is a, you know, we're talking about guns and gear and gadgets. This is a really effective training tool. So I have a Cool Fire converted Beretta 92. You can see that barrel is a red barrel. So this is a safe barrel. It can't be fired, can't be loaded. And this is basically a Tipman paintball compressed CO2 canister, right? So when I take this Cool Fire barrel, I can gas the barrel up, right? And once the barrel is full of compressed CO2, when I pull the trigger, I get fell recoil. So if you're trying to work on your trigger reset speed, you know, one-handed shooting, whatever else, I get fell recoil. It's not exactly like live fire recoil, but it's very, very, very close, folks. Uh, and it's the only way you can dry fire, right, you know, and, and work on the ability to reset the trigger. One of the things that we talk about, matter of fact, Phil and I actually talked about in our classes years ago, was the accelerated pull versus the controlled pull, the accelerated competition pull versus the controlled competition pull. We came up with that term, I think, in a motel room years ago. And the difference between just pulling through the trigger or prepping and pressing on a harder shot is what I'm talking about. And a cool fire trainer will allow you to work that skill. So if you're looking for a, a tool that will truly improve your dry fire, check these things out because they're really awesome, incredible products, okay? Um, of course, uh, Precision Holster is also one of our sponsors. I don't know if Rich is going to post some of the discount codes. Maybe he is. I think he probably already does. Uh, if you're looking for the Seaclander signature line, I think Phil Strader's got one of these suckers, by the way. Hey, we're at 95. We're almost hitting 100. Well, we hit 99 a minute ago, Mike. We hit 99, we're going to hit 100. There's no doubt in my mind. That's the kind of the subdued flag design. I went with stars and stripes on this one, as well as the Ultra Penix holster. Okay. All right. So let's, any, any questions? Rich, before I move into guns and some other gear. Yes, Mr. Phil Strader, the, the esteemed Phil Strader, says, I love my new Precision Holsters rig. I'm going to use it to destroy you, Mike. I can't wait, man. I, Phil Strader, I can't wait for that. I can't wait to get destroyed by you, man. And Mark says, what is your opinion on paddle holsters? I hate paddle holsters, Mark. You could take your paddle holster and throw it in the trash. I have. Uh, I can't tell you how many classes I've been in, and I know there's some, some purposes behind some paddle holsters where I've had students, and I've actually seen this at matches as well, where they draw the handgun, and the handgun comes out with the holster, right? Most paddle holsters, the best paddle holster made is probably the paddle holster by Safari Land, but even it, for, a, for true carry purposes, will not suffice and hold the handgun like you need it to in a dynamic situation or a fight. And like I said, I've seen more holsters come out off belts with paddle holsters 
than anything else. So I would absolutely positively get rid of the paddle. I would put a belt loop attachment on that same holster and run a belt loop attachment or, you know, the dots hangers, which I'm running on my holster as well. Okay. So that's what I think about paddle holster. Emmanuel wanted to know if we had a discount code for the cool fire trainer. I've put that in today's show notes. Cool. Yes, we do have a discount code for the precision holsters as well as the cool fire trainer. So, so check them out. Um, all right. So let's, let's talk about, um, let's talk about guns real quick. Let, well, let's well, Mike, about... we have another question. If you're okay, throw it up there. Guy wants to know, is it possible to purchase the exact same design of your holster? Yes. So, uh, if, if you're guy, uh, if you're talking about um, the signature line, absolutely. Matter of fact, if you re if folks, if, if any of you reach out to Precision Holsters and you want to set up exactly like mine, just reach out to John. Write that down. John at Precision Holsters. His name is John Marquez. He's the one of the owner CEO of Precision Holsters. He's a fantastic shot, top level competitive shooter. Great guy. He helped. He designed the signature line with my help. I mean, I basically said, yes, I like this, or no, I don't like this. He designed it. So if you're looking for the fast holster or the ultra appendix inside the waistband, just ask for John and he'll he'll get you set up. Okay. Because it's a specific line that they sell. Um, they have they offer a bunch of different colors. If you prefer different colors, that's fine. But if you want the C-Cleaner line, that's exactly what it's going to look like and be set up as. Okay. Ooh. And at the end of the year, uh, Phil Strader says it's going to be called the Strader Series. We'll see, we'll see about that, Mr. Schrader. We'll see about that. So, hey, um, let, let's talk about gun setup. So a few things that I want you to consider with your gun setup. And once again, you know, read the rule book. And I have a bunch of guns. I'm going to show you a carry optic gun. I'm going to show you a second carry optic gun. So I have two different alternatives and versions that I'm going to show you another single stack gun. Okay. This is actually one of my single stack guns that I set up for ESP. Okay. So the, the first things, first things first, let's talk about the basics. Um, this grip series and magwell combination is what's called a techwell grip and magwell combination matter of fact i have a discount code for techwell for the first time ever they have uh done a discount code i'll post it in the show notes here in a second or maybe in the in this thing um if you reach out to them i think it's cclander 15 so maybe try that it's 15 percent off they've never done a discount code before but the reason i like the techwell system is um, and I'll show you a different version here. Basically, the way these things work is this is a smaller carry magwell. This is a little bit different grip. I don't love the shape of this grip. If you saw the other grip, I like the skateboard tape ones. But this is a very, very aggressive grip panel. But the way this works is there's a small slot. So they, they offer, they probably have, uh, Phil probably knows, I think he runs Techwell as well. They probably have 50 different variations of grips out there from the skateboard tape cover to one to different colors to different uh, you know aggressiveness and all of them are mounted uh, to the magwell itself with those little slots so basically when you mount the handgun you put the grip on the the actual magwell fits inside those slots when you tighten down the grip the magwell is is in place so you can get this magwell which is a smaller carry magwell um so this magwell which is the one I have for IDPA, which is a little bit bigger. This is kind of a variation I've modified slightly of the, the TGO to the full-size magwell that I use on my single stack gun, which is a little bit bigger hole. So, you know, in terms of magwells on your handgun and grip surface, we'll talk about that in a second. Set yourself up for success in terms of your guns. So for those of you that are shooting USPSA production or um, IDPA uh, sorry, uh, not ESP. I'm drawing a like someone SSP. Help me out. SSP. Um, what I see a lot of times is the inner portion of the magwell still has a small square ridge. So if you look at the inside portion of my Wilson combat gun, this area would normally be completely squared off, but you can see I've used a file or a Dremel. And some of this is from practice and reloads, but I filed and rounded some of that off. So the first thing I want to talk about is setting your gun up for success. Make sure you have no square edges inside your magwell within the rules to facilitate, you know, easy reloads. Okay. Uh, the other thing I want you to consider is friction, right? So the more, uh, you know, when you, we're talking about control and recoil, we're talking about friction and leverage. The more friction you have between your palms, your hands, and the grips themselves, the better. Which is why I select the skateboard tape covered grip panels. I mean, these are very, very sticky. There's a lot of friction. 
So when I'm shooting these versus a, a slicker grip or a less aggressive grip, there's a big difference in my ability to control recoil. It's also why we use pro grip when we compete. So, so address both, you know, your, your magwell's areas and your friction. If you look at this magwell, I'm not sure if you could tell, but the front of the magwell here is filed so it's rounded off slightly. I don't want that small square because any little square area that can catch on, you know, the tip of the round in the magazine as I'm doing my loads um, is going to slow me down just a little bit. Okay. Speaking of loads, I'll give you another little trick. Here's your other trick. Um, this is uh, one of my magazines for a SIG 320. I'll show you my carry optic gun here in a second. But on my base pads, you're going to see skateboard tape as well, right? Just make sure it's legal in the division you're shooting. You may see skateboard tape or you may see stippling. So on your magazines, right, I place skateboard tape. So that increases the friction between my magazine and my hand. So when I'm shoving the magazine in the gun, that increase in friction is going to make my reload a little bit more consistent. So there's a little trick for you as well. Uh, that's a, by the way, that's a, a Henning Walgren base pad. Uh, he sent me some base pads for some Glocks and 320s. Uh, so I have some of his, some of Terrence base pads as well. Okay. Hey, by the way, we never hit 100. But we're, we're very close. I saw like 98 one time or whatever else. Got a question, Mike. Mm-hmm. Mr. Alan Kelly, our good friend up in Free Virginia, says, I train and instruct extensively with Smith & Wesson m and 9. Would it be a good platform for competition? Yeah, great question. So, Alan, uh, and all of you wondering, hey, I maybe you just jumped on today and you've never competed, right? And you're like, well, what gun do I use in competition? And I can, I can tell you this. There are some guns that are better than others, right? But there's no one perfect gun. You know, if you look at the guns I have, I have the 1911 I just showed you. You know, I have a one version of a carry optic gun. This is a Wilson Combat 320. I have another version of a carry optic gun that I could shoot an IDPA. I can't shoot this in USPSA carry optics, but I can an IDPA, which is a 1911 with an optic on it. So your Smith & Wesson MP series, depending on what length, it would, would be just fine. You, depending if it's a shorter version, um, or the full size version, you could, you know, you could shoot that in, you could shoot that in, uh, SSP, you could shoot that in ESP, you could shoot it probably in CCP, depending on the length. Uh, but yeah, you know, Alan, find a division that, that, that best suits that particular gun. And that would be fine. Almost any gun you have is going to be fine in competition when you're starting out. If you haven't competed a lot, right. You know, I could tell you, uh, you know, Mr. Phil Strader's on, he and I could probably grab any gun. Any gun you want and go compete successfully with it. Although there are guns we're going to shoot better than others, right? Um, so there's there's a thought for you. Rich, Tony, any other questions? Yeah. Tony wants to know, do you think competing using a 3 o'clock position and carrying appendix inside the waistband daily can cause any training scars or action errors? So uh, I do that, Tony. I compete because right now... Um, it's not legal in IDPA to, to, to compete in, with a inside the waistband appendix position holster. So I carry daily with my appendix holster and I compete on a regular basis with the gun at three o'clock and the mag pouch at three-ish o'clock. Uh, no, I, I don't think there's a training scar. And I would equate it to, you know, the, I think, say, for example, you might own a car and you might own a motorcycle and you can drive the car very fast and successfully. And if you ride your bike a lot, you can drive your motorcycle very successfully. And under stress, you know, on your motorcycle, you're not going to reach down and try to step on the brake that you have in your car. So I think if you've hardwired the system in and, you know, you've, you've practiced your draw or your competition draw, I don't think you're going to end up uh, creating a training scar. I just don't believe that. I just, I just think our... I think our brain is smarter. A brand new shooter is probably better off staying in one system or series of guns as, as well as one carry position, like a guy in law enforcement that can compete with his duty holster and carry his duty holster. That would probably make sense to me, a guy or girl, um, versus switching gun position. But I don't personally think it, it creates a huge training scar. Okay. Guile well, says, aside from grip tape, what other tapes can we use uh, for our mags and guns? Uh, so God, I, I, I don't know what else. Um, so just, a, this grip comes with the grip tape on, um, this gun, one of my carry optics guns, it, this is our Wilson combat frame as well as slide on the SIG 320. It's a SIG collaboration with Wilson combat, right? So this grip is actually pretty aggressive the way it comes from Wilson combat. 
but it's not ag- aggressive enough for me. I like a really, really aggressive grip. If they built a grip that was a, 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 as aggressive as I want it to be, most people couldn't shoot it. It would tear your hands up, right? So this is actual, uh, it's not, this is probably skateboard tape or step tape. Like you can buy those little strips of tape that you could put on steps outside that have has very aggressive uh, resin on it. And you can cut it into the shape you need to. Um, there's a company that makes a lot of these pre-cut grip tapes as well. I'm drawing a blanket what their, uh, their, their name is. They're not my sponsor, but I order their grip tape as well. Um, but no, I don't, I don't know of anything that would work quite as good as this, to be honest with you, Gilly. I mean, maybe, maybe there's some other things, but I don't know why you wouldn't just use, you know, skateboard tape or something like that. So Mike, okay. we hit a hundred a little while ago. I don't know if Did you we? saw that. Holy moly. I did not see that folks. That's incredible. Craig says you're talking about Talon grips. Talon. That's exactly right. Talon grips and Talon has several variations. Uh, so if you want skateboard tape, make sure you order the one that's actual skateboard tape. It, it feels like sandpaper is what it feels like. Okay. Um, Dion yeah, wants to know, Mike, are all yeah, yeah. calibers shootable in IPSC, USPSA, IDPA, etc.? Uh, so Dion, that's a, that's a very big question. Te- technically, I would say, yes, all calibers are shootable, but in IDPA and USPSA, you have multiple divisions, five or so divisions, and every one of those divisions has a caliber requirement. So if you're going to jump into IDPA or jump into USPSA, once again, Go to the rule book and check out the caliber. So, for example, if you're going to shoot um, uh, CDP, custom defensive pistol, you're going to have to shoot a, a, a 45 or above. If you're going to shoot ESP in IDPA, then you can compete with 9 millimeter if you want to. You could shoot a bigger caliber if you wanted to as well in minor. So you're really going to once again have to look at the division that best fits the gun you're using or going to use. Uh, and then see what caliber that particular division uh, supports. Okay. Thanks, Mike. We have another question here from Jason. Okay. Jason says, do you switch back and forth between guns and different formats, for IDPA, USPSA, frequently or stick to one gun and format for a while, then switch? I would think going back and forth between CDP and carry optics would be difficult. Yeah, so l- let me answer that question. So here's, here's the deal, folks. Let me, let me pick up a couple guns here. Let's do... So the... The answer is, if I am trying to switch from a completely different trigger system and grip uh, and sighting system back and forth, for let, let me let me be very specific. For Mike Seeklander, as much as I shoot and train on the different systems that Wilson Combat makes and sells, this is not a big issue. For most of you that don't have the resources and the time to put into it that I do, you're going to be much more successful focusing on one thing. So, for example, uh, and I'll give you another great example. If you decided that you wanted to carry a uh, competed carry optic, right, um, and you wanted to compete in carry optic in IDPA and USPSA, in IDPA, you could shoot this gun with an optic on it in carry optic, or you could shoot this gun with carry optic. But I could not compete in USPSA with this gun. You can't. The carry optic has to be basically a production legal gun with an optic on it, right? So in that case, I would use this gun in both sports. I would not want to switch back and forth. It wouldn't make any sense for most of you. You're going to be more successful if you pick one frame, one gun, and stick with that. And I will also tell you, if you're thinking about divisions and and switching divisions up, I think a lot of people run to divisions. So they go and they shoot a division for a while. And they have no success or they have they have a failure in that division. So they think by switching divisions, they're going to be successful and awesome. That's not the case. Also, don't be a board shooter, right? Don't don't when I mean a board, like you get bored. Ah, I shoot this gun now, I'm bored with it. So I want to switch to something else. You'll never be as good as you could possibly be. So my recommendation for most of you is to stick to one division on a cycle. So let's say your yearly cycle for 2022 is to shoot carry optics in USPSA or NIDPA, and maybe you carry a SIG variant firearm on a daily basis. That's a win. That's competing with one gun and one system across the board. Uh, I would recommend that. I think that would make sense. For me, maybe it makes sense if I'm carrying a 1911, my carry gun is a 1911, well, maybe I should shoot a, shoot a 1911 in, you know, in competition as well. But it's hard, you know, Rich and the viewers right now, almost 100 again, by the way, it's hard for me to give you a definitive answer that's the same answer for maybe Mike Seeklander as it is for you all. But most of you, I would tell you, 
Focus on one division at a time. I would love for you to pick a yearly cycle, pick a division, and try to master that division. Be as good as you possibly can be before you switch up to another gun or another gear. Because Rich and I say this all the time in our business discussions. If everything is a priority, nothing's a priority. So make that one gun and one system your priority. Okay. All right, Mr. Rich, what else do we have as far as questions? And I'll I'll get into some more gun tips here in a second. Yeah, uh, Jason says thanks, Mike. And Brandon says production for life. Production for life. I like the yeah. general. And it and it Joey says, does IDPA have power factors, i.e. chrono checks? Their scoring isn't major minor like USPSA, is it? Scoring is not major minor, but they do have power factors, but it's divisional. So for example, if you shoot custom defensive pistol, you have to shoot a 45 or above and it has to meet a minimum power requirement to meet that division's uh, power factor. If you shoot ESP, you have a, a lighter power factor. It's you know minimum power factor, uh, but, and you can shoot a 9mm in ESP. So I can shoot a 1911 in both divisions, you know, but one of my 1911s would be uh, 45, and the other one would be 9mm. Matter of fact, a good comparison is if you look at these two guns, uh, this they, they look nearly identical. This particular gun in my left hand is my USPSA single stack setup in 40 caliber CQB Elite. The one on my right hand is set up for ESP. It's set up in 9mm, okay? I shoot the 40 major in USPSA because it's very difficult to shoot minor and score well. Uh, I shoot minor in the 9mm in ESP because that's what the division requires, and there'd be no reason for me to shoot a, a bigger caliber, uh, if that makes any sense. Okay. Good and Mike, uh, Chris has done a phenomenal job this morning of referencing rule books. So please go back and look at all those references that she's put up this morning. Cool. Yeah, folks. And I, that's kind of, if you're jumping on now, I know some of you are, by the way, we had a fantastic showing today, almost a hundred, we hit a hundred. That's incredible. That was our yearly goal. So you have to read the rule book. You just, if not, I, I, I here's, I'll give you a full disclosure. I went to a match uh, years ago, it was the IDPA Nationals, right? Here's a, here's something may, you may not know. Uh, went to the gun check area. I had had a, I was shooting for Smith & Wesson back then. I had a Smith & Wesson 45. I think I was shooting CDP, obviously CDP. They go to do my gun check and they start to test my safeties. And my gunsmith at the time had deactivated. I don't know if it was, I think it was the firing pin safety. I think that gun had a firing pin block safety. Anyways, he deactivated one of those safeties for a slightly better trigger job. And guess what? Mike Seeklender got sent home, or I got to tape the rest of the day. I got DQ'd for the match because of a gun violation for you. So you got to decide what division you're thinking about shooting and then make sure you are legal. Make sure your holster's legal. Make sure your belt's legal. Make sure your mag pouch are legal. Make sure your firearm is legal, okay, in that division, okay? Emmanuel has a question, Mike. He says, how do you yeah. overcome plateaus in training? I made CCP expert pretty quickly, but have been chasing master for almost two years. What advice do you have for pushing through a wall in your training? So we're going to talk a lot about performance, um, Emmanuel, in the future live streams. But let, let's let, if, you, if you think about this for a second, then I'll get back to some gun-centric stuff. If you're training, there, there are three things you could train to do faster. Number one, you can train to shoot the gun faster. That's all grip trigger sights. You know, mastering the, the grip place, placement of, of, the, of your hands on the handgun, uh, the pressure, uh, the manipulation of the trigger, understanding the difference between the accelerated pull and the control pull, understanding which one relates to accuracy, which one relates to speed, and then learning how to actually fire the shot without moving the gun, right? You can shoot the gun faster. Number two, you can learn to move the gun faster. So when I fire that shot on target, how do, how do I learn to drive the gun faster and then read the alignment of the gun faster? And then number three, you can learn to move faster. So if you're trying to overcome something, you're an expert shooter right now. You know, you're a, uh, you're a, uh, whatever level shooter, you know, you're a marksman shooter right now and you want to get to the next level, the way you can get to the next level is use a series of skill building exercises, as my buddy Travis says, or drills to work on those three areas. Because those are all, the only three things we could do better or faster. We can shoot the gun faster, we can move the gun faster, and we can learn to move our body faster and be ready to shoot sooner. That's it. That's all you can work at. Um, if you haven't mastered the fundamentals, right, which is why I talk about my fundamentals program, you can get it on sale still on my website. If you haven't mastered the fundamentals, it really doesn't matter if you're moving the gun fast, you're moving your body fast, if you can't shoot uh, and hit, hit good shots. And for those of you that are IDPA shooters, I suspect a lot of you are, you know, if you haven't mastered the ability, you know, to pull the trigger without moving the gun, that's huge. Because every time you shoot a shot that's not a zero 
on the target, you're losing a second. So if you could take an extra tenth of a second and pull the trigger without moving the gun, right, that tenth of a second will gain you 0.9 in terms of time or score. So the fundamentals, the fundamental ability to place your hands on the handgun and pull the trigger without moving the gun, shoot with one hand without moving the gun is critical, and that's how you're going to go to the next level. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Joey says, are your 1911s all 70 series or are some 80 series? Sounds like if you have an 80 with a firing pin block, it might right. still work. Yeah, so good question, Joey. So on all, on, on all of these uh, Wilson comments, I don't know if historically Wilson built a lot of 80 series uh, 1911s. And if you don't know what the, an 80 series 1911 is, uh, I don't know. I think it was probably Colt. Someone quote me if I'm wrong. Colt eventually added a fire-in pin plunger drop safety, basically. So as you pull the trigger, there was a small lever that was activated, uh, activates a plunger on a spring that will allow the fire-in pin to travel freely. Uh, what you found most gunsmiths doing on 1911 systems was deactivating that because that added a half a pound or a pound of the trigger pull. It was more creep. It just it just made the trigger harder to make it a, a really good trigger. So I've never owned, as far as I know, any of the models uh, the, of the Wilson Combats that I own. None of them are Series 80s or none of them have a firing pin drop block safety. Uh, so no, there there would technically I guess be series eighties. I'm sorry, series seventies, nineteen eleven systems um, because they don't make that. Um, so, but I, I also run you know a very definitive manual safety as well as active grip safeties, which I have to. I have to have all of my safeties active for uh, IDPA in USPSA. I think technically you can deactivate the grip safety, but I still run an active grip safety. I want all of the safeties active on my firearms if I possibly can. Okay. We're at 101, Mike. We hit 104 a moment ago. Man, that's freaking incredible, man. Wow. Um, oh, so Rich, if you have more questions, feed it to me. But I want to show you just, just a couple other things that I do. So we talked about the inners, the magwell. Um, I do want to talk about triggers. If you look at all of my 1911s, you're going to see a medium length or a longer length flat trigger, right? So if you're wondering, well, Mike, why, why do I run a flat trigger? Because I like uh, the ability to pull the trigger, and no matter where my finger hits that trigger, I'm still reaching the same distance. Now, I'm not saying curved triggers are necessarily bad, but I found flat triggers to be a little bit better in terms of consistency. And if you look at the length of my trigger finger and trigger length comparison, the farther out my finger is on the trigger, the faster I can pull it. The farther back my finger is on a trigger, the slower it is for me to reset and pull it. So I want a little bit longer trigger, and I like a flat trigger as well. Uh, on this gun, you're probably wondering, what is this? Does, did Mike C. Kleiner lose control of the trail mold? No, I simply relief a little bit of material on the grip so I can hit the mag release a little bit easier, right? I'm also, um, in terms of this, the mag release, something I learned from Rob Latham is I've changed the spring weight out of my mag, mag release. So if you get a standard 1911, you probably change the spring weight out in a lot of different guns, but a little bit lighter spring weight allows me to hit that mag release a little bit faster, a little bit easier, but you don't want to go too light where you might compress that mag release with your thumb. So there's a couple other tips for you. Um, in terms of sights, if you can look at this handgun, this handgun has a pretty specific sight that Wilson does for me. And inside the sight, let me give you... Uh, let me give you a different visual. Inside this site, you can see there's a fiber optic, right? I'll just let the camera focus on that. So there's a small fiber optic rod, but the fiber optic rod does not run all the way through the back of the site. So there's a small gap there. So what that allows me to do is have a fiber optic dot in the site itself. This is so difficult to do, right? I'm not sure if you can see this with the lights, right? Um, but the, the fiber optic only uh, exposes the light just through that small hole in the rear side. Now, these are also serrated. So it takes any, uh, the back of the front side is serrated. So it takes any of that uh, glare off the side. Because if you have glare on your front sight, that's going to change how you visually see it. Now, my rear sight notch is a little bit bigger. So if I'll hold this up a little bit, as you can see this rear sight notch, right? It's kind of got a big U in it. So I, I kind of like the, the U style rear sight notch just a little bit easier to see the relationship of the front and the rear sight. Let me see if you can see that. 
like I said, that is the single most difficult thing I do on camera. Um, so uh, I don't want too wide of a rear sight in terms of the U, and I don't want too narrow of a rear sight. If the, the more precise I shoot, like if I went back to shooting Bianchi, I might go with a very precise rear sight. So that's an, an example of what I do in my sighting systems. Um, this one, jerk, 108, yeah. Mike. 108. Yeah. 108, brother. Oh, 108, man. Did you, I'm sorry. I thought I said wait. 108. <laughs> that is fantastic. I wonder if we can hit like 128. Uh, that is incredible. We get 100, 108 live viewers. Wow, folks. Hey, by the way, we're going to jump on next week, and we're going to be doing some work. We're going to be doing some draws. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some key secrets to speeding up your draw process. So bring your gear. If, you, if you're jumping on this morning, set a calendar reminder right now, 7.30 a.m. Wednesday next week. Bring your gun. Bring your holster. Bring your gear. We're going to do it together. I'm going to run a timer and show you some keys to speed up your draw process. And maybe we'll talk about reloads as well. So, uh, Mike, we got some questions, brother. All right, let's let's throw them out there, man. Then we'll start to wrap this sucker. Okay. John says, Mike, do you ever compete bug and what's your bug? And follow up to that, he also says, is how do you change your grip with a bug, if at all? Yeah, so I've yeah competed bug several years. Back when we used to have the bug nationals, I won the nationals two years in a row. So I have competed bug and won at the national level. Uh, I shot a compact 1911 general. I actually have my bug gun here, compact 1911. Uh, but in terms of the grip, if you can imagine the, the grip on the compact 1911 is the exact same size. It just sticks a little bit farther down on the full length gun, and it would be a little shorter on the bug gun. So I don't change anything in the grip. Matter of fact, all handguns, I, in essence, I grip the same. If you can see how my hands are forming around the grip, the bigger the grip panels, you know, the, the, the bigger the grip, the more my hands open and, you know, it, because the grip's bigger, the smaller the grip, the more my hands come together. That's it. That's the only difference. There are no variations and no change in the grip. And sorry, man, I got all these dirty hands. I guess I got one of those guns that are dirty. And Mike, just, just for the people that may not know what BUG stands for, can you please tell the audience? Sure. BUG is uh, the Backup Gun Division in IDPA. Uh, back in the day, they used to have the Smith and, Smith and Wesson Indoor Championships, and they also held the bug nationals a couple of years in a row uh, you had to pick between revolver or iron sights they didn't have an optics division and i competed in the iron sight auto division okay hey cool. thanks to the hunter joining us right now vicky pine our good friend vicky has a question mike she says series 70 colts have some extra parts to reduce so-called trigger bounce and series 80s have the firing pin block with the wilson comet 1911s be pre-series 70 meaning the original 1911 design uh, Vicky, I don't know. I, I don't know what they're technically called. Uh, I could tell you that, uh, I could tell you that none of the guns that I know of and currently own with Wilson combat have a fire pin block. They've, they've eliminated that Bill Wilson, I think made a decision for whatever reason a long time ago, but I can't speak for, for why I would suspect that if he were building guns back in the day and he had a series 80, 80s type Colt system with a fire and pin plunger and block, he probably would have removed that to do a better trigger job on the gun. But I can't speak for that. Maybe some of the Wilson Combat folks are on right now on the live stream and you can answer that question. Um, uh, but I, like, I, for example, my first uh, 1911 was a Series 80 Colt Gold, Gold Cup and my gunsmith immediately removed that firing pin block safety to do a better trigger job on it. So, Joey wants to know, do you wear any special shooting glasses, Rudy's, Oakley, etc.? Good indoor, question. Indoor, I'm indoor. sorry. I yeah, indoor versus outdoor, Mike. I meant to bring my shooting glasses. Uh, I I could get them. I don't really want to walk away from the live stream. Typically, I'm I'm using if I'm using if I'm shooting one of my carry optics guns. Of course, because I'm focusing on the target at target distance, I don't need any correction. So I'm using my standard Oakleys. I'll use the they have a specific hue or color that's a slightly red. I think it's called Prism or something. It's a slightly red tint, but it makes Everything, the target, everything very crisp and very clear. Matter of fact, I think the AMU guys worked with Oakley to help design that particular lens. So you could check those out. Now, when I'm shooting my iron sights, because I have to be able to focus on the front and the rear sight and the relationship, I'm using um, corrected lenses made by Decote, D-E-C-O-T. If you look them up, um, they, matter of fact, I was... Uh, I was sent glasses by them. They sponsored me and sent me my shooting glasses. And I have a clear, I have the same red lens color. I don't know what the name of it is. And then I have a darker one for extremely bright days. And the way I, of course, as you can see, if you're on the live stream, 
I'm left eye dominant, right? You can see me bring the gun in front of my left eye. So on my shooting glasses, my left lens is a correction of, I think it's 0.75, and the right lens is clear. So my left lens allows me to focus clearly on the front sight, and my right uh, lens, it's clear, allows me to focus at target distance, and then my brain puts the two things together. Uh, Rob Latham turned me on to the company, and they're fantastic. So if you're looking for corrected vision shooting glasses, Look up D-E-C-O-T. Maybe someone can post a link or whatever else. Okay? Nikki says, what is that front sight called? Is that from Wilson Combat? I don't know what it's called. Uh, it, it is. Uh, man, I hope I'm not getting myself in trouble here. But I'm going to do it anyways because I'm paid to show their stuff off. I don't know if you can order this model on some of the standard handguns as a selection. You may have to special request this. Just tell Wilson Combat. And if I get in trouble for this, then hopefully they don't fire me. The, the front sight that Mike C. Klenner has on his on his ESP guns, right, or 1911s. So that they can probably do that for you. Like I said, if I get fired, then maybe Phil Strader can monitor me at SIG or something. But, yeah, that they make that special for me. I don't know if they're production making that sight yet or not, so you can find out. So We hit 109, brother. 109. This is fantastic, dude. This is unbelievable. Yeah, 110. Uh, Eric has a question, brother. So yes. the Techwell Magwell, is it only held in place by the grips or is additional gunsmithing required? No, it's, it's Eric, in terms of your question, they have a very precise slot. Like when you mount it, I'm not sure if you can see how it fits in there, but once it fits in there, it fits in very precise. It's nothing other than by, you basically take the grips off, you put the Techwell on, you put the grips back on and it's held in place, which is the beauty, beauty of the system. And then you can select the Techwell you want and the grip size you want uh, as well. So this is, this is I don't love this grip shape. This is something Bob was playing with over at Techwell. I don't love it a lot. Uh, I love the skateboard tape variant a little bit better, but yeah, that's the perfect thing about the Techwell, so. All right, Mike, uh, we have some uh, greetings from uh, IDPA Club down in Guatemala. Thanks for wow. being on guys. And John wants to know what kind of uh, shooting, do you, I'm sorry, shoes do you wear for your shooting competitions? Man, should I I take my shoe off real quick? <laughs> okay. Hey. I do everything. So these are the Solomon Speed Cross 3. Sorry, it's a little dirty. I was in the mud yesterday. Uh, they have a new variation of this, but they're these are pretty wore down. But these are very aggressive tread shoes. I think Phil Strader and I think found these years ago. Uh, he found them and he's like, man, what's your shoe size? I'll order you a pair. He actually had sent a pair. I've been wearing them as my everyday shoes and competition shoes for years now. Solomon probably owes me a million dollars because I've sold some of these suckers, but that's my everyday competition shoe. That's my actual everyday wear shoe as well as my competition shoe as well. So what else? Yes. Uh, John says, follow up. Have you found an in-ear ear pro, not headphones, that are worth a darn? Nope, I, I have not. I wear I wear external um, microphone earphones, probably the same ones I was wearing in the class that you were at, John. But no, I, I've not. But and I'm not saying that there's not a, a variety out there that's, that are good, but I don't own any that that have been incredible. So nothing. We had 110 a while ago, Mike. Just for your uh, situational awareness, but Gerald has a question. Says sunlight can make your dot invisible. Have you encountered that with your optic? No, uh, Gerald, I, I have not. Um, these the both of the optics on these guns are delta point pros you know they have they have a very clear clean window uh they do have a very bright dot these are the 2.5 minute of angle optics i i am going to order a bigger dot i keep talking about that i've yet to order it to see if i like a slightly bigger dot better um they're not fully enclosed like some of the optics and you may say well mike how do you select your optic well i want an optic that has a battery compartment on the top I want an optic that holds zero. I want an optic that's very robust. Uh, and by the way, this is not the only optic I own. I own I, I, I own the RMRs. I own uh, several hollow suns. So I'm not sponsored by an optic. I don't, I don't have one that I choose. I just said I like the window on the Delta Point Pros. I like the adjustability. Uh, Leopold has a lifetime warranty. So I've, I've sent a bunch back because they had a, a, a battery component compartment or issue they had to fix on a bunch of them from some of their original versions. Um, but I haven't, you know, unless I'm shooting directly into the sun or the sun is directly on my back, my dot does not disappear in terms of that. Of course, a fully enclosed site may help that out. 
The downside to a fully enclosed optic is it's heavier. So I can feel the difference between, you know, a one ounce or a one and a half ounce optic. You know, I want as light as optic as possible as that slide is traveled. So, I, so that's the reason I select that. But no, I haven't had that issue too much, you know, with the, with the dot. So, okay. Frank says, how do you change up your clothing for cold weather training and how, and how long a session would you recommend? So, wow, Frank, that's a kind of an interesting question. I'm, I'm actually wearing, this is a 511 sends me some shirts and stuff. I love them. But this is Merino wool. It's a really thin uh, shirt that kind of fits tight, which I like. So I can tuck it in. I can, I can layer this. I can put this or even a second shirt on. I can put a T-shirt on the outside of it. Uh, if you don't own a Merino wool or a wool shirt, it's huge in terms of layering your system or your clothes to train with. So basically I just start to look at the temperature outside. I start with a base layer and then I continue to layer past that. Of course, if you're shooting IDPA, you know, you could just wear a jacket that you could sweep and effectively train with your jacket on, which I do sometimes. Um, but, you know, typically I'll just wear several layers, starting with a base layer of something made of merino. I have a, some thicker shirts as well that are made out of wool and I start with that good base layer and then I add layers beyond that to the point where you know i, I can tuck shirt a couple other tricks for cold weather take your ammo put in your ammo bag uh you know however much ammo you're going to be loading your magazines put them under your heater in your car as you're driving to the range i used to i used to run to the range for 30 minutes my ammo is nice and warm right don't get it too hot be careful all your cautions so then when you're prepping your magazines it's heat or you know if you have the ability to keep it in your car That'll help keep your hands warm as well. Hand warmers are great. Another little trick for you. Take those hand warmers you can buy at the store. Um, you can actually take tape them or put those little wrist sweatbands and put a hand warmer. And if you keep the hand warmer along the veins on your inner wrist, it doesn't really get in your way of manipulating or shooting the handgun. But it, believe it or not, it'll keep your hands toasty warm without gloves on. So there's some cold weather tricks for you, right? Man, good stuff, Mike. Jason says, how do you do you co-witness all your optics? Yeah, good question, Jason. So um, in terms of this one, there's no co-witness at all. It doesn't have a front and rear sight. Uh, I do have another slide that has a front sight on it because I, I kind of prefer to have the ability, if I lose my optic on a stage, to reference the front sight with some alignment in the rear you know, optic. The uh, Delta Point, the Leopold makes a, a little thing you could put in here that's like a rear sight. I would like to say uh, I want a lower third co-witnessed. Um, this particular optic, I'm not sure if you can see if the dot is on here. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that from camera. There we go. You yep. can see the front sight um, in relation to the dot. It's a lower third to an extent co-optic -opt because I can have the dot higher than the front sight there, right? Um, but I, if I need to use the, the sights too, I, I would prefer the – so in terms of co-witnessing, you know, if, you're, if your dot is here, right, um, if you co-witness directly in the center, that would mean your front and your rear sight would directly be in the center of the optic window. If it's co-witness in the lower third, then when you align your iron sights, they may be in the lower third of the window, so that gets them out of your vision just a little bit. I prefer the lower third or lower co-witnessing. Um, this particular setup has a little bit taller front sight, but I don't find the front sight gets in my way. Uh, or whatever else, but it is there if I need it. So oftentimes in practice, I'll end or start, I'll just reach up and turn the optic off and draw. And what I'm doing there is I'm making my brain recognize, okay, the, the dot's not there, use your sights, use your iron sights, right? And I can only barely see them above the optic. So I, that's the preferred setup. Um, so, yeah, I don't think I answered that question. Yeah, you did, but we're, we're speaking about competitive context only, right, Mike, when it comes to co-witnessing optics? Yeah, I, I am, but I would tell you that even for defensive context, you could do true co-witnessing of the sights. Here's the deal. Uh, I, I, would, I want iron sights that I can quickly reference and use if I need to if the dot fails. But if we talk about defensive context, to be honest with you, at most distances, if you have the threat <clears throat> in the window of the optic, at whatever distance we're shooting at, it's probably going to be four, five, six, seven, eight yards away. You're going to get hits. The bottom line there is if you want to use a lower third or a little bit higher co-witnessing, it's all fine. It, it works just fine. Just have iron sights or at least a front sight that you know how to line up with your rear sight quickly uh, or the rear a rear portion of the optic quickly in order to get 
get good hits. Okay? Great, great, great response. Rob has a question here I've never heard before. With a mag wheel and ambi safety, how do you keep your 1911 underweight for an IDPA? Um, so my th these are actually I don't know about well underweight, but the ambi safety adds almost no weight in terms of the weight itself. Like the difference between the, a normal safety and the ambi safety. Um, not a problem whatsoever because that's there's almost no weight there. Uh, and then these, you know, depends on the grip combination you use. These are a little heavier than these. These are made of a, like a, some sort of composite, right? So this might be a little bit lighter system. These might be a little heavier, but the grips themselves are made out of aluminum as well as the magwell. So I'm, this is not a steel magwell. It's an aluminum magwell. So you're going to select aluminum parts, but I'm, I'm not well, like, like huge amount underweight, but I'm still way underweight in terms of ESP. There's, there's no problem with weight there. Thanks, Mike. Joey says, how important do you think it is for a semi-serious shooter, i.e. traveling to matches within a few states, to have an identical backup competition gun along with him? Thinking about buying one after a mishap ruined a sectional match in a neighboring state last season. Yeah, Joey, if you're serious, you probably need a backup gun or at a minimum, maybe a backup top end, a backup slide. But I've never competed ever since I've started and not had some sort of backup gun. And the way I use a backup gun, oftentimes I will do most of my training with my backup gun. So it has the most wear and tear. And in theory, if it has the most wear and tear, it's the one most likely to break. And my newest or my freshest gun is going to be my competition gun. And it's had less wear and tear. And I think it will be less likely to break or have some damage, you know, that might affect the match. Eric says, do you use pro grip? And I believe you do, Mike, when you compete. And if so, do you use it when you dry fire as well? Yeah, Eric, I, I do have pro grip. I actually have some, uh, I think it's Petzl. Maybe it's spelled Petzl. I was giving a tube, given a tube of this. Uh, it's the same stuff that climbers use, this climber's chalk. And it actually comes in tube form where you can squirt it in your hand. I use that now more than I use pro grip. I do like pro grip. Uh, I don't use it a lot, to be honest with you. I don't train with it. I don't dry fire it. I might use it in matches if my hands are a little bit sweaty. Uh, I don't have anything against it. Like uh, my buddy Rob Latham doesn't like Pro Grips, Pro Grip, because he thinks it makes his mags sticky so the mags don't come out of the gun. So, yes, I do, Eric, but I don't rely on it anymore. I just don't use it that much. You know, I, I use my, I use good grip pressure, good placement of the hands, you know, good friction on the gun itself uh, versus Pro Grip, but I'm not opposed to it. I'll tell you, many years ago, for those watching right now, a little secret, Pro Grip has a specific smell, right? So you, this sounds crazy, but I used to, I could smell in my visualizations of being calm and trying to be not super calm, maybe that's not the word, but it in control, you know, I used to sniff that Pro Grip and go, okay, that's the smell. I, I, I'm in control. I'm relaxed. I used to utilize a, uh, and Rich, we talk about this in our, our FID. Yes, we do. I've never actually told you this, but I smell the pro grip and that reminds me of, you know, grip, the, you know, grip the gun hard, see the sights, be aggressive. You know, it's a mental thing. I don't know if it helped or not. But. That's all the questions, Mike. That's all the questions, man, folks. That's incredible. Uh, 840. We went over an hour this morning. Well, 730 to 840. So, hey, folks, thank you for jumping on. We talked about a lot of things. I started off, you know, with the belt system to the mag pouch, gave you some tricks on your holsters and your mag pouches. Uh, then we talked about guns. We've talked about optics on handguns. We've talked about divisions. We've talked about uh, what you can actually do to improve, you know, the three things you can actually improve. So this is awesome. We had 108, almost 110 live viewers. Uh, what an incredible live stream, folks. If you if you have an interest in any of the programs that uh, I offer or Rich and I offer, they're in the description. Just click those links. Uh, if you want to learn more about the fundamentals program, of course, you can get on my website. Uh, Mr. Rich, you have a live stream this Friday. Folks, if you haven't jumped on with, uh, we used to call it Coffee with Rich. It still is Coffee with Rich on Friday. Oftentimes, he'll have a fantastic guest. Sometimes I'm on with him. Sometimes I'm not. But if you have a chance, jump on Coffee with Rich this coming Friday at 730. And uh, next week, set your calendar, set your reminder, get your gun, get your gear, get your holster, and join me next week, Wednesday at 730. Mr. Rich, what else do you have uh, to close us out? Nothing. I just want to thank all. I saw a lot of coin members on this morning. Thank you, coin members of the American Warrior Society for being on. Really appreciate you watching Mike and all the information he has to share with us. All right, folks. Also, if you are watching this on the IDPA page, shout out to you, IDPA members and IDPA Facebook pagers. I will be on live stream on that page as well next week. Matter of fact, I think all week or all month, 
If IDPA is okay with it, I will be on that page as well. So I hope to see you on that page maybe next week at 0730. Uh, Sandra, I see your question. How do you access this? You can actually go back and rewind the video on Facebook and watch it again. But we will also post it in on YouTube sometime in the next few days. Sometimes I'll edit these things and cut out some of my banter and coffee drinking and uh, post, post it on the um, on the YouTube as well. Mr. Nelson, I see your question. How do you become a Quinn member? Uh, maybe Rich can throw up a, a Quinn member um, link. If not, Nelson, go to AmericanWarriorSociety.com. That's all of our defensive content. Uh, and of course, the you know the featured membership we featured last month with the defensive handgun cycle. Okay, so uh, what else? Linda, welcome. By the way, Coin members, thank you for jumping on. Chris, thank you so much for sharing and having us host today. And uh, Rich, anything else before we jump off here, man? No, thanks so much, guys. All right, folks, that's it. Hey, practice. That's what makes a difference. Until then, train hard. <laughs>